Hello. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So uh, today we'll be talking about how at Get Your Guide we built uh, our next generation ETL pipeline. Uh, we changed data capture by using Debezium Kafka uh, Databricks and Spark. Uh, yeah, we just had a short intro, so I guess I'm going to skip this part. Uh, then let's have a look at the agenda. <clears throat> so first I'm just going to talk a little bit about Get Your Guide, uh, who we are, what we do. Then we're going to uh, have a, a brief overview of our old legacy ETL pipeline, uh, the issues you had, and why we decided to move away from it. Uh, then we're going to deep dive into Rivulus, which is our new ETL pipeline, uh, and the, man, the main benefits that comes with it. Uh, later, uh, we're just going to finish on like, some conclusions, uh, the main benefits that we got by implementing this new data pipeline, and then we have, uh, yeah, I think we might have like five minutes for questions in the end. <laughs> All right. Not working? Not anymore. Uh-oh. Okay, one second. Apologies. Oh, man. Just, 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 just press present and then it's going to be fine, I think. Uh, we okay. don't have the... Yep. Okay. All right, so we're just going to go without the notes then. Uh, OK, so get your guide. Uh, what we do, so our goal is to make sure that when you're traveling, you can find great experiences that's going to make your trip memorable. So we offer uh, an online booking platform. Uh, so we have apps uh, as well as the website. And you can book tours and activities uh, in many different languages and many different currencies. So a few numbers uh, about us. We have over 50,000 different products. So these include tours, attractions, uh, walking tours, culinary experiences, and so on. We sold over 25 million tickets so far. Uh, and our team, uh, with more than 600 people and uh, from over 150 different uh, nationalities. And in total, we've got more than uh, 650 million in funding so far. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone, my name is David. Uh, and before we dive into introducing our new solution and our new pipeline, I wanted to give you a little overview of like where we started and why we wanted to move away from our legacy systems. So um, our legacy stack comprised of two main components. I don't know if anyone is familiar here with uh, Pentaho, which is a graphical ETL tool. That's what uh, we started using over six years ago in our team to manage our ETL pipelines. It's a very, it, it serves us very well. It's a very feature-rich tool where you can do a lot starting from ingestion to data processing all the way to loading that data into various data source, uh, stores. And then we had Postgres as our data warehouse. Um, but as time went on, this uh, infrastructure started to serve us um, less well, um, and that was partly due to the tool itself and partly due to how our design evolved. So in particular, one big issue that we were facing with our legacy system was that it was vulnerable to breaking schema changes. So what that means is that when a producer uh, upstream um, dropped the column, changed the column type in an incompatible way, our pipeline would very often break. We did our best to try to kind of mitigate that with paying very close attention to what uh, the upstream data producers were doing to their data sets, but that was obvious an imperfect solution and there were quite a few incidents uh, that was caused by this. Um, another issue we were facing is that Pentaho, uh, as I said, it's a graphical ETL tool. It's not even the newest uh, graphical ETL tool. Uh, operating it requires special knowledge it's, and it's the kind of knowledge that uh, less and less of us on the team had, um, and it was also not a knowledge that we were particularly hiring for. Um, so it became kind of an issue to extend our pipeline. It was also becoming kind of a bottleneck because uh, analysts weren't able to write their own transformations and add to our pipelines. They were always dependent on us from the data platform team to do it for them. 
Um, we had pretty long processing, but more importantly, long recovery times, and I will talk more about that later in the second half of this talk. Um, and finally, uh, the pipeline was pretty difficult to test. This was partly uh, attributable to some of the design choices that we have made along the way, but also just due to the fact that we were working with a graphical tool, um, which is notoriously hard to test. So in overall, we had pretty bad SLAs when, uh, at the beginning of uh, this year, and we knew that something had to change. So we wanted to build a system um, that would be able to handle these upstream schema changes automatically, so we would be less vulnerable to them. Um, we wanted to move away from Pentaho and start using tools that we, uh, in the data platform team as data engineers, but also our analysts were familiar with. Um, we wanted to decrease recovery times by maximizing parallelism. Um, and yeah, as I said, I will talk more about that later. And we wanted to build a system <coughs> that was designed for testability from the ground up in hopes that these things in combined would improve our SLAs. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you David. All right, so then uh, we're gonna introduce Rivulus, which is our new ETL pipeline. So first question we usually get is what is Rivulus? Uh, so Rivulus means uh, stream in Latin. So since we're doing uh, a change data capture solution, we thought it was gonna be a good name. Um, so the way we're gonna explain it is we're gonna start from a very high level overview. Uh, like cutting through these layers, talking briefly about the components, and then in the end, uh, Dave's gonna tie back everything, uh, like how, he, how it works and how it's executed in the DAG in Airflow. So <clears throat> on a very high level, we have on the extraction layer, uh, we're using Debezium, which I'm gonna get into more detail, but what it does is it reads um, the event log of your database. In our case, we're using Aurora and MySQL, so it reads the bin log, and then it streams that back to Kafka. Uh, then we have the schema service, which is a, a, a Scala application we developed in order to deal primarily with the issue we have of uh, breaking schema changes. Uh, these changes come from upstream, uh, from migrations in the source database that we have no control of. Um, then we have our converter, which is a very simple uh, application. Um, so the output uh, of the, the Kafka topics uh, is in Avro, and what we use in our data lake is Parquet. So what it does is converts Avro to Parquet. Then we have the upsert component, which as this is a, uh, a change log, you might have many different records for the same uh, primary key. So what the upsert component does is it compacts that log based on a specific primary key, getting the, the, the last record based on the timestamp. Uh, so then at this point we have uh, basically a copy of the source database. Then we have the transformation layer. Uh, which is where we execute all the, the, the tables, we execute all the transformation to create all the tables. So first of all, we have this list of SQL transformations. Here we're talking around 150, 160 different uh, transformations that we have, and each one of those uh, generates a table in the, in the data warehouse. Uh, we have the executor app, which reads in uh, these uh, SQL libraries and then uh, executes the, the, the code. <coughs> Uh, the code is executed uh, via Airflow using the Databricks API. Uh, and then we have the dependency graph builder, which as we're gonna show later, uh, our SQL libraries, uh, our SQL transformations, they have some specific syntax, which helps us identify what other tables they depend on. So that when we build the DAG on Airflow, we have the correct order. And then Airflow, which is like very core part of it. At the end, we have all this data in our data warehouse where Databricks, Databricks sits on top, and then on top of Databricks we have Looker, which is a reporting tool connecting, connecting through the cluster via a JDBC connection in Databricks. <coughs> so the extraction layer. Um, so this is a, a, like not a so high level uh, overview of the pipeline. So we have several different source databases. Um, as I mentioned, right now we're using mostly MySQL and Aurora. Uh, and then we have the, the CDC ingestion pipeline. Um, so here it starts with the Bezium, which is, a, uh, as I mentioned, a Kafka Connect application. It reads in uh, the event log from the, from, the, from the source database, writes that to another Kafka topic, so one Kafka topic per table, and then at the very end we have another sync connector from, from Kafka Connect, which writes data to, to S3. Uh, and then that's where Avro Converter picks up the data and then converts it to Parquet. 
Uh, right now in our infrastructure, we actually have two of these pipelines, one that's using Debezium and the other one which is simpler, which is using JDBC. So it simply uh, reads the data from a snapshot DB and outputs the Parquet file directly. Uh, this is something that we're deprecating and our new pipeline is Debezium. So uh, for this talk, we're just gonna focus on the Debezium side of things. Uh, <clears throat> then once we have this Parquet data in S3, uh, this remember is a, is a change log. So that's when the, the upstart component uh, kicks in. Um, and then based on that, it's gonna communicate with the schema service to get the correct primary key, uh, and then compact this log, which at the end of the day becomes a table, uh, which what we, what we call right now is the bmihr, is one schema we have in Databricks, and that reflects exactly what we have in the source database. Um, one important thing I forgot to mention is, um, the Avro converter, when it's converting the files from Avro to Parquet, it also communicates with schema service to make sure that it only selects fields that are valid and that we can ensure uh, downstream compatibility of the data. So if let's say uh, we had one field that was entered in the database and then they had a migration and this field is now a string, uh, we already have a table in the bmihr with this field as, a, as, a, as an integer. So that's not a valid uh, schema change. So then, Avro Converter is gonna send this information to schema service. Schema service is gonna reply back with the correct fields and the correct types you should select. Cool, so then, uh, yeah, explaining a little bit more in detail the components. Uh, Debezium, uh, it's actually a tool maintained by Red Hat. Uh, it's really good, like highly recommended. Uh, it can connect to many different databases, uh, even like MongoDB, Cassandra, and others. Uh, it works as part of Kafka Connect, so if you already have Kafka Connect running, it's just literally like plug and play. You can configure the specific tables you wanna, uh, you wanna follow, uh, and then it's gonna uh, read the, the bean log for those tables and then write to, to Kafka. Uh, one thing that's very, very nice is that this is a very lightweight process. It's not monitoring the tables themselves, but just monitoring the bean log. So it's a super lightweight process. Um, Schema service, which is a very, very core part uh, of, our, of our pipeline. So the schema service, it has like uh, many features. One of them is holding the, the primary key and the timestamp keys that we use in order to compact the logs. So whenever we wanna ingest a new table, uh, we set up uh, on the schema service what the, the, the primary key is and what the timestamp is for that specific column. And then based on that, the absurd component is able to compact the data and then schema service also keeps track of all the fields and all the types that we've ever seen for that specific table in order to ensure that we have uh, the correct uh, compatible types for downstream tables. Um, we also already upcast types. Uh, so for instance, if a field is integer, we always upcast it to long. This is to ensure that when we have migrations on the source database that are gonna eventually turn those integer fields to a higher precision, we already handled that in advance, so we don't have to change the data that was already written. Um, so that's it about schema service. Then we have our converter, which as I mentioned is a very simple application. Uh, this is executed also as part of our uh, main DAG on, on Airflow. So what it does, it reads the, the Avro files, communicates with schema service, and then select only the, the valid fields. Uh, and then the upstart. Um, so the upstart component, again, it communicates with schema service to get the primary key and the, the timestamp column. Based on that, it's able to read all the data that, uh, that came in and merge it together with the data that was already in the, in the hive table. And this is the, the output of the extraction layer. Um, yeah, so now we'll talk a little bit about the transformation layer, um, the second big chunk uh, from that uh, diagram that Tiago showed at the beginning. Um, before uh, I walk you through all the components that we have implemented here, um, I uh, wanted to uh, give a brief intro uh, into something that our team has experienced, but I also think it's pretty common for BI or data teams, um, and that has to do with the inefficient management of dependencies as the complexity of the data landscape grows. So what happened at Get Your Guide is that, as I mentioned, it was around six years ago that the first BI person was hired. Um, <clears throat> it was a pretty simple data landscape 
uh, he was asked to build a pretty simple data warehouse with only a few facts and dimensions. And it was pretty straightforward, a pretty straightforward task to kind of figure out all the dependencies between the various transformation tasks, so between facts and dimensions, and the source tables. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, these were our humble beginnings. Um, however, as time went on, and more people were added to the team, and also as the business grew and developed, and uh, as a result of that, the complexity of the data landscape also increased. Um, managing and tracking and tracing these dependencies between the transformations became more difficult and more challenging. There were more fact and more dimension tables. Um, I don't know, like you can uh, uh, imagine an example where you have fact one that depends on dimension two and three, and then you have another fact that also depends on dimension three, but in, in addition to that depends on fact one as well. So it's, it becomes kind of intract intractable after a while. Um, so what happened at Get Your Guide, and again, I think this is generalizable, the team had to make a choice between data completeness and optimal dependency management. And what I mean by that is uh, in order to make sure that the data that uh, was loaded to our data warehouse eventually was correct, uh, our team decided to simplify uh, this problem and basically take some shortcuts and split, it the, and split the pipeline into three stages. So there was an extraction stage that had to finish before the dimensions were computed, and that stage had to finish before the facts were computed. And in each of these stages, all of the transformation tasks were executed sequentially to ensure that dependencies were always met. Uh, but this was a suboptimal and a crude way to, to manage dependencies. So this obviously resulted in a perform performance bottleneck, uh, and this is what eventually really hurt our SLAs. Um, it meant that our processing times were unreasonably long, but it was even more, um, the, the effect of it was even more strongly felt in recovery times, because you can imagine that, I don't know, one morning we realized that for some reason uh, the data in one dimension table was wrong, uh, in order to rerun the pipeline, we would, have to have, uh, we would have to rerun the entire dimension computing stage and then the entire fact computing stage, uh, when in reality, the true dependencies probably were much leaner than that. <clears throat> so uh, this was uh, one of the things that motivated us to build a transformation layer that was built for lean dependencies and automatic uh, dependency detection and inference, um, and I will show you how we did that. So our transformation layer consists of four main components. Um, there is a library of SQL transformations. These are just pretty standard uh, Spark SQL files with a little bit of uh, twist to them, uh, uh, some special syntax elements that we have introduced and that I will show on the next slide. Then we have an executor app that is able to uh, understand these SQL files and run them as Spark jobs. Um, we have a dependency graph builder whose task is to basically parse all of the files in our SQL library, so all of the SQL transformations, and uh, using these special syntax elements, infer the dependencies between the various transformations and also the source tables that we ingest through the extraction layer. And then finally, we have Airflow, which executes the dependency graph uh, that is generated by the dependency graph builder. Um, so the special syntax elements can be seen on this slide. Um, actually, the two more important ones that I want to highlight are at the top. So the first one uh, indicates that a trend, if you see, if this syntax element appears in an SQL transformation, it indicates that the transformation depends on an other transformation that is defined in the same SQL library. So if we had, I don't know, let's say a transformation called dim tour option and it contained this reference, it would mean that dim tour has to be computed before dim tour option uh, can be created. Um, 
They can, uh, there's a second type of uh, dependency reference, uh, so, uh, which is a source dependency, and this means that uh, basically a table needs to be ingested from a source database and go through our <coughs> CDC ingestion pipeline um, before this transformation can be executed. And then the final um, special syntax element is just uh, to make sure that our code base and our SQL transformations are as dry as possible. It basically lets our users reuse uh, SQL select statements that are used in multiple SQL transformations, but that are basically sub-selects that we don't want to materialize on our data lake. So I want to give you an example of how all of this ties together. So right here you can see one of uh, the transformations that we have in our SQL library. Um, the logic itself is super simple and it's not very important. I think this transformation is called fact NPS feedback. And as you can see, uh, it declares two dependencies. One dependency on a source table, uh, GYG NPS feedback and one dependency on, a, on another transformation, dim MPS feedback stage. So during build time, we will um, let the dependency graph builder parse this file and all other files that are uh, in the SQL library and um, create a JSON object uh, similar to the one you can see here, where the key becomes the name of the transformation itself and inside it, it has two members, source dependencies and transformation dependencies. These are arrays, which in this case uh, are of size one, uh, and they tell you what uh, sources need to be loaded and what other transformations need to run before fact and PS <laughs> feedback can be executed. Then also during build time, we pass this information over to Airflow in the form of an Airflow variable. So this JSON as is becomes an Airflow variable, and then our Airflow DAC code uh, is written in a pretty generic way uh, and will actually generate uh, the final Airflow DAG. And what you can see uh, here is the transformation. Uh, you can see that the transformation depends on another transformation, DIM NPS feedback stage. And in line with what Tiago explained about our extraction layer, which consists of first uh, extracting the logs, the CDC logs, uh, from either the Bezium or through a JDBC loader. Uh, that's what you can see here. And then we feed that data through the upsert component. And at the end of this upsert, do we actually have the source table GYG NPS feedback available on our data lake? So that's the dependency declared here. So it's a really um, lean dependency graph. It couldn't be leaner. It's really like this fact NPS feedback transformation depends on exactly what it needs to depend on, nothing more, nothing less. And then during runtime, we execute all of these uh, jobs on Databricks. So one last thing I wanted to mention, because uh, at the intro I alluded to the importance of testing and how we wanted to basically improve our system and uh, build it for uh, better testability. Um, and here again, I have to go back to uh, the importance of dependencies. So um, in our um, legacy pipeline, because we had all these sequential tasks and basically this very bloated uh, dependency, um, in a case where we change the module, let's call it module B, uh, and we wanted to make sure that it's down, that downstream nothing broke from the change that we introduced, we would have to run module B, C, D, and E uh, until we could be confident that uh, our, our job was done. Uh, even if the actual dependency only existed between module B and module E. Now with our automatic dependency inference and our lean dependencies, module, B, uh, module E will actually, in fact, only depend on module B. So if we want to make sure that our change uh, in module B doesn't break anything downstream, we only need to execute these two tasks. So that really uh, cuts down uh, how long it takes to test our pipelines 
end to end. So that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is it's pretty straightforward. It's kind of software development best practices 101, but it's not trivial to do in a graphical ETL tool like the one we used to have in the past. We put a lot of emphasis in separating all of our config from our code. So now it's really easy to run our entire pipeline end to end uh, without affecting any production data. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So yeah, then let's jump to the conclusion. Uh, this is when we're gonna see the, the benefits uh, of our new solution. So first and foremost, the most important thing for us was that we should be able to handle uh, schema changes gracefully. And now we're able to do that um, due to schema service and our converter. So no more breaking schema changes. Um, because right now we're just using SQL, 100% SQL with some special syntax. Anybody can write transformations and it's very, very, very easy. Um, our recovery time now is super, super minimal. So we went from literally five hours in case something crashed because we had to execute the whole process all over again, even if something crashed at the very end, uh, to literally a few minutes in case something crashes. <clears throat> uh, so the DAG uh, is also like the components in the DAG, uh, they are designed for testability. So what that means is in our build pipeline, uh, in our CI tool, we're actually able to execute the whole pipeline end to end reading from production and writing to a, to a, to a testing uh, folder uh, so that we know for sure that the change we implemented, the transformations that are there, that the, the changes that we made in the components, they're gonna run when we reach production, which is something that we could not do before. And yeah, we cut processing by uh, 70%. So now this DAG takes uh, less than two hours to run, a bit less than two hours. Uh, further optimizations are possible. I think if we really try, we can actually get it down to like one hour processing. So our initial uh, starting point was five hours. We're down to two, but further optimizations are still possible. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to finish like on a, on a next steps uh, slide because this is just like the beginning. Uh, for, for this specific uh, application we developed, specific pipeline. Um, so we have offices all over the world, and one issue we had before is that when this main process was running in the evening for us in Berlin, because we're based in Berlin, that meant that users that lived in Australia, for instance, they couldn't really access Looker because some tables were being recreated. So that was actually a pretty bad user experience. With Riverloads, we don't have this problem anymore. We can update the data anytime throughout the day and people can keep querying the data. So like in Spark, basically, we always write to a different path so that you don't have this file not found exception while you're trying to read the data. Uh, right now, we're running this pipeline twice a day, but our goal is to uh, to run it uh, more often uh, by the end of the year. Another thing that we wanna do is, right now we have our own custom uh, upstart component. We know that Delta um, also offers that with the, the merge command. This is something we wanna try, so we definitely wanna POC that and see if we can actually get uh, better performance benefits from it. Um, <clears throat> so this is something that we did in our team, like data platform, but as a data-driven company, many, many teams use Airflow and Databricks and Spark and so on. And there, you always have to you know, replicate, move data from A to B. Uh, so then what we want to do is, since this setup with DBs works so well, um, we want to make sure that this is actually the standard way in the company to, to load data. So by doing this, we're able to reduce or reduce the uh, like the many processes we have to snapshot data, which is usually a heavy process. You have to uh, read all the data from one database and then dump into a different uh, snapshot DB. This is a very expensive process. By using Debezium and replicating data with Debezium, you don't, you don't have the need for this process anymore. So that's a, a pretty big win for us. Um, and then <clears throat> since writing transformations with SQL is just so easy, uh, we wanna make sure that anybody in the company can do that. So at Get Your Guide, we have uh, many different data analysts that are uh, working um, in different teams. And one request that we get like pretty often is that 
Basically, they wrote some specific transformation, uh, some specific analysis in a, in a notebook, and they want to schedule that to be run every day. So first thing they do is, we use Databricks, they go there and they schedule in Databricks. Uh, but since they don't know exactly when the data is being refreshed, it might be that the, the view of the data they have is not consistent with uh, the data we have in the, in, the, in the final data warehouse, just because they schedule it a bit before the data is actually refreshed. So that means uh, it comes to us, like the data engineers, the data platform team, since we know when things are uh, scheduled and executed, <clears throat> there comes a request for us to schedule this uh, transformation in our pipelines. Uh, and what we want to do is, by leveraging Revolus and this whole infrastructure we created, all they have to do now is simply create a pull request and then everything is already scheduled uh, with retries and monitoring. Everything is like for free out of the box. So that's it for us. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have questions, yep. Check, check. You're next. Oh. All right, there's two over here. Hey, um, thanks a lot for our presentation. It was quite interesting. Um, my question is mostly about data quality checks. So, if you do them, what kind of framework do you use? Is kind of something internal pre-built tool, or do you use something like AWS DQ, for example? So how do you manage to do the data quality checks? Quality checks. Data quality checks. Yeah, exactly. Do you mean uh, <clears throat> daily, like after the pipeline, or like after pipeline execution, how do we check whether the data? So right now we have, uh, our solution is probably not as sophisticated as we would like to have it uh, in the long run, but right now what we have is a, is a separate DAG in Airflow um, where we also leverage the schema service actually. Uh, so what we do there is that for each source table that we load, we have a task that queries the source database again uh, and gets the distinct count of records uh, using the primary key. And that's a pretty fast operation because we're using the primary key. Um, and then we also do a select count star on the target table that our pipeline uh, created. Uh, and then we compare those two counts and we have automatic alerting if there's a mismatch. But we wanna add like uh, basically the ability to add custom SQL um, that our pipeline would execute every day and uh, or after each run of the pipeline uh, and to validate that the data is correct. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk uh, and thanks for sharing your journey. Uh, lesson learned. Uh, uh, two questions actually. One is you discuss about your custom observed. Uh, so you, you seem that you build an internal delta yourself, so can you elaborate uh, on that? How, how, how do you manage the, the uh, changes and how do you uh, ensure that you're writing on the previous data? Mm -hmm. And the second one is that it seems that you're using uh, Airflow and everything is uh, uh, treated as a batch job. So how do you envision going forward and uh, going into the more real-time streaming data? How, how, how you see your path to towards more real-time data in your uh, data pipeline. Okay, uh, I guess I can, I can start uh, with the upsert. So right now with upsert, the way it works is we receive this changelog data, uh, and then the first thing it does is it connects to uh, the schema service, it gets the primary keys, and then it gets the, the timestamp column. Um, so, in this case, actually, like for, for, for most of the tables, we just use the, the bean log timestamp, which comes with the, with the Bezium. So we get the primary key, uh, we have the bean log timestamp from the Bezium, and then we compact. So that means at this point, we have one record uh, per primary key. With that, we do a full alter join uh, with the existing data. And then uh, after this full alter join, we select only, only the new data. Uh, and with this way, we get the, the new data, and the Bezium also generates a record for the deletion operations. So in case it's deletion, we just don't select that. In case it's new data, we select the new one, 
and for the rest, uh, we just keep as is. Um, yeah, and then the other question, or you want to add something? Um, n I mean, there is a there is a small uh, performance tweaking for really tar large tables. Is that uh, we partition the output data set by an immutable uh, date time column. Um, actually, we uh, truncate it to month, um, and then basically we inspect the change data that has come in. We select all the distinct values of the. The, of that date column truncated to the month, and then we only read in from the existing data set uh, the records that correspond to to that to those partitions, uh, and then we do a full a, a full override, but it's a dynamic override, so um, only overrides the affected partitions. Um, yeah. And the yeah. second question was sorry. Uh, it's uh, how 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 do we envision? Uh, the Bizum and the... Oh. Right, let's, let's just have the one question because we do okay. have some other folks that, that have questions as well. Thank you. Um, my question is related to the uh, reading process of the bin log. How do you make sure that it doesn't dis disturb the source system? Sorry, uh, can you repeat it? I assume the bin log would be written to by the source system as well and you're reading from it. So how do you make sure that uh, it's, it's, it doesn't disturb the database engine? You know, you're basically reading the transaction log, right? Yeah. And the database engine is, I assume, continuously writing to the transaction log, and you're reading from it, and there is a read and write process simultaneously. So I just want to know, how do you make sure that it doesn't conflict with each other? Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think I got it. Uh, okay. it it's, not a, it's not a read and write process simultaneously. So when the MySQL server commits a transaction uh, uh, together with the commit, it also writes to the binary logs. And then the Bezium itself actually registers itself as a MySQL server, as a slave, essentially, uh, because this is the default replication mechanism of MySQL. Uh, between masters and slaves, or masters and masters. Um, and so, yeah, the Bezium acts as a slave, essentially, uh, for the purposes of the uh, MySQL uh, or Percona cluster or, or whatever we're talking about. So it doesn't affect the performance of the SARS database uh, whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the speech. Uh, my question is, have you faced with a problem such a uh, a lot of small files, like uh, uh, as a result of execution uh, Spark SQL, and how did you manage it? How did you know how many partitions, how many files uh, you should create? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So for um, yeah, for the small file problem, what we do is before we write out the the, the data, uh, we simply do a row count. So we have more or less hard coded uh, in the code. So let's say. We know that 500,000 uh, 500, records per, per file, it's, it's a good size. And then basically that's what we do. So we just do the total count of the data set uh, by this number, and then we do repartition based on that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not like very easy to, to, to solve this problem. So this is actually a pretty simple solution, and it gives pretty, pretty decent performance for, for our cases. Okay, you, you mentioned in your old architecture you were using uh, PostgreSQL, I think, as, as a database for the data warehouse. Which database are you using for the data warehouse right now? And uh, you're still keeping raw data in some place, and you have a staging area in some place on your data warehouse table. And can you map it to, to technologies? Um, so we're using uh, our, like, our whole data lake and data warehouse is S3. It's S3 and Parquet. So wait, wait, this is where you keep your raw data, right? Yeah. But that's also our data warehouse. We just have like register hive tables on top of our files. And, so you're not using And then we have a JDBC connection uh, to that hive server from our reporting tools. So you're using hive as a, yeah. as a yeah. data warehouse. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, um, Revolus. So um, I think this problem of creating um, dynamic SQL code uh, is pretty common. Um, so my question I was trying to figure out was open source solutions are available 
and I have found this um, DBT. Um, so my question is, for a company that is starting to look at this problem of creating this graph uh, and the dependency and dynamic SQL code, um, do you think it's better to um, start from an open source project uh, or would you uh, write your own solution because you think that the problem is very um, specific to every use case? Yeah, I think um, if you don't have any specific um, requirements, then you should definitely go for an open source solution. This is actually a tool that we found after uh, we started working on our pipeline. And yeah, we, we figured out that there was a solution out there doing something slightly similar. The thing about DBT is that it doesn't support Spark. And also, uh, we wanted to use Airflow as our execution engine, as opposed to DBT's own uh, solution. But to be absolutely honest, I think the part where you uh, parse the SQL files and generate this dependency graph is one of the most straightforward part of this whole project. So that's what's keeping you from doing it yourself. Uh, I think that's not a really big hurdle. So we're just going to do one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. And I'm sure that they would love to be mobbed out in the hallway for <laughs> additional questions if you have them. Just kidding. Leave them alone. They did a great job. Um, so here's the last question, and then we'll call it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the session. Uh, I see in your entire CDC flow, you use Avro and Parquet. I understand the reason for Avro, like to manage the schema changes, you've gone with Avro. So I'm trying to understand the complexity we, we, you are introducing, the format changes from Avro to Parquet. It's additional burden as part of CDC flow. So what's your comment on that? Can, can you repeat, please? I couldn't really get it. I mean, the, the acoustic here is a bit. Yep. Uh, you use Avro and Parquet as part of your CDC flow. Mm -hmm. So Avro, I understand CDC. As part of CDC, you wanted to uh, have that schema changes preserved. For that, you use Avro. That's the reason. And you. As part of this flow, you introduce Avro to Parquet, means that there is a type conversion in terms of format. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, in, you yourself have introduced a format conversion, which additionally introduces a burden as part of CDC flow. So what's your recommendation? Is all the time Parquet should be used, or any other formats, or um, to avoid all the complexity? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I, like in our case, we always use Parquet uh, simply because Spark plays very nicely with Parquet, and yeah, that's like the, the main reason. But I think like Avro would work just fine. They're they're both like they do same things. Uh, they are like different under the hood, uh, but I guess it depends on specific requirements you might have. Okay, everyone, uh, thanks for coming out today. Let's give them another warm round of applause. Thank you.